Now let me introduce uh, the, uh, Mr. Alan Arch to you. Uh, he will be making a presentation on gear manufacturing. And Mr. Alan Arch has been serving as the chair of our um, industrial advisory board for a number of years now. And um, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce him to you. And he will be making a presentation on how he manufactures gears. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, we'll go again. Um, my company is up in the northwest section of Miami. Uh, we build specialty gears and we build all different types. We go up to six feet in diameter and the smallest gear I've ever made was a millimeter in diameter. It was for a device before laser. Uh, it was a device that was inserted into your eye and had a little tiny cutter. And it actually cut the lens out of your eye and then removed it. And it was a set of bevel gears that we cut with a microscope mounted on the machines. It was very cool. Uh, but most of the stuff that we make is handy. You can hold it in your hands. You can walk in it. And I'm going to do that today. I'm going to pass around some gears. I'm going to tell you about the different kinds of gears. I'm going to talk about the cutters that we use and the tools that we use to do that. I would, I meant to bring some band-aids today, but the cutters are very sharp, so be careful of them as we pass them around, but you'll get a chance to hold them, see how heavy they are, see what they look like. And I just tell you to be careful because I've been cut by them enough to know that I don't want to cut them anymore. If in, in your little packet I have there, it's a little bit about the company itself. And there's also, we were written up a few months ago in Modern Machine Shop, which is a very nice magazine that uh, machine shops use. They, they have some several million um, circulation, and we had a fellow write a very nice article about Southern Gear. And, and I kind of gave an outline of what we're going to talk about today. And I'll try to zip through this, because I know this is a relatively short, short class, OK? The most common types of gears, the most common type is a spur gear. And that's this one right here. And I, I might enlist your aid to bring them out for me. Can you do that? Um, this is spur gear. This actually goes into a GE jet engine. What it actually does, I don't know. But this is about a $5,000 gear. And it goes through almost 100 operations to manufacture it. This happens to be a bad one. But you know we hate to make bad ones. But th that's what this is. But this gear is a spur gear, straight teeth. Most common type of gear, you'll see it in lots of different kinds of machinery and equipment. And we'll pass that around, okay? Um, if you're gonna design something for cost effectiveness and you want it to be relatively inexpensive, spur gear is the way to go. It also is the simplest to design in terms of bearing loads because it virtually has very, very little thrust load. The second type of gear is a helical gear. And this is a helical gear, it goes at an angle. And you can see if you ran two of these together, what they try to do is drive themselves apart. And when they try to drive themselves apart, you get thrust loads on the bearing or the shafts that's holding them. So you have to wear, use thrust load type bearings, Timken taper roller bearings like you have in the front end of your car and that kind of thing. That's the same kind of thing here. So designing this is a bit trickier. It's sometimes quieter. It will take a heavier load in the same numbers of teeth. You can run it faster than you can a spur gear. So this is a, I, I don't even know where this one came from. I, I know it's some kind of heavy trans, uh, transmission. It's a much bigger pitch gear. And it goes into some kind of transmission, but I don't remember exactly what it was. I'll get that to pass around. That's a helical gear. By the way, if, if you think of a question, just stick your hand up and raise your hand and, and ask me. Don't feel bad about interrupting me. Because what will happen is if you save the question to the end, I'll forget the answer and you'll forget the question. Okay, So just feel free to interrupt any time along, ask a question, uh, and I'll be glad to answer it. Another type of gear is when the, in the old days of planetary gears, Model Ts, they had a lot of internal gears. But we still make a lot of internal gears. So if you know the, the Apache helicopter has a bunch of funny looking bumps on the nose of it. And it has a target and a navigation system in the front of those little bumps on the nose of the, and it goes into almost every helicopter. Uh, the gears we make for that are, are internals. Uh, 
This one doesn't happen to be one of those because they're much bigger. But this one goes into um, a, an aircraft aircraft system that is air conditioning, and I don't know quite how it works, but it has an, actually an external and an internal gear in there. And I, I make some big ones, but it really gets heavy to haul them around. So I tried to pick something that would fit in my suitcase too, by the way. So that's an internal um, with an external on it too as well. Then we have worm and worm gears. This is a set. It's actually got a thread in the center. So it, I think it's driving a screw back and forth as you turn it. These are good because of ratios. You can put a tremendous ratio. For instance, if you have a single thread, this one actually has to be, happens to be a fourth star. But if you have a single thread and 100 teeth, you have a 100 to 1 ratio. And to get a 100 to 1 ratio in a spur gear system in the same area, you just can't do it. The, you can't make the teeth small enough in the pinion and big enough in the gear to get that kind of ratio. So a worm and a worm drive is a great thing to put a ratio. You have to run them in oil. They have to be matched. The, if you look, as I pass this around, I'll pass the set, you'll see a radius in the bottom. That radius in the tooth matches the outside diameter of this worm. So it, when it sits in there, it sits very nicely in the, in the uh, worm and worm gear set. So if you're going to do a big ratio, worm and worm gears, this one has four starts. So if this was 100 teeth, it would be a 25 to 1 ratio, divided by 4. If it's 3, divided by 3. If it's 2, it would be 50 to 1. If it's 1 to 1, it's 100 to 1. I don't really know how many teeth are in that, but I just brought these samples along. So this is a worm and worm gear. Good for ratios, OK? Then we have bevel gears. We're going to turn a corner, kind of like the rear end gears in your car when they are now the front end when you go around a corner. In cars, they use hypoids where they're not on center. We, for the most part, almost all our gears are center lined. We don't make any hypoid gears. So with, there are several different kinds. There's a spiral, which I actually don't make. It actually has a curve to it on the tooth form. Um, all I make is straight bevels. And hypoids and spirals are made on very special Gleason machines, very much in the automotive industry, not so much in my, my particular industry. That's why we only do straights. So I've got a bevel gear here. This one goes into a GE jet engine. Um, I make about 700 of these a year. Kind of gives you an idea how many engines they're building because it's one set per engine. And so this is a, this is 17 4 pH stainless. Heat treated about 1100, so it's in the early 40s, low 40s, in hardness. And we, we heat treat it first. We drill all those holes. Uh, we cut a spline in it. You'll see there's a spline on the inside here. Um, it has its mate. The mate is uh, gear with a whole bunch of internal splines and very, very light. Uh, what it actually does in the engine, I, I don't know, but I know that's where it goes. That's, that's a straight bevel. That one turns a corner. Okay. Then we have some things that also turn a corner, and they're called face gears. And this is a face gear. And what this runs with is a spur gear, our first one that we talked about right in the beginning. And the spur gear will rotate like this, and it runs in this crazy looking tooth. This is actually two different face gears. There's another one on the other side. Um, by the way, engineers make works of art. You realize that you're very artistic in what you do. When you make a drawing or you design something, it's very artistic. And I say that to my machinist because I believe my machinists, although maybe not classically trained engineers, they are engineers. They think about it. They think about how it machines. And when they get done, they take a chunk of steel. This started out as kind of probably rough on the outside, sawed on the sides. And they turn it into what I believe is a work of art. Some of these are absolutely gorgeous. So. The, the men and women that work for me really are, in, in many ways, engineers, but in many ways are artistic. Some of them are very artistic. You know, artists are sometimes temperamental. Engineers, not so much. Uh, but I got some temperamental engineers uh, that work, work in my shop. So this is a face gear. Um, it's, it's a complicated part. And it goes into one of those high-speed gun systems. Uh, I've been to Vermont where they test these. And I've seen one of these guns fire 100 rounds, and you blink your eyes, and you've missed the, 
the firing of these guns. They're very, very interesting to watch them fire the guns. So I've, I've seen them, and it's, uh, it, and it's pretty good. And you can't even see the gears work. And they, the gun looks like the house of Jack built. And you can't figure out how the darn thing works. And they said if they, I said, so how does it work? And they said, if we told you, we'd have to kill you. So <laughs> I'm still alive, so they didn't tell me what, what that was. So that's a face gear, okay? Herringbone gears, another type of gear, and I don't even have a sample of them, but think about that. It's a helical gear, it's a double, some people call them double helicals, but they're, they look like herringbones. And they're a helical right hand and a helical left hand, and they run, it's, it's disappearing. It used to be a, a much more common gear, but with the materials that have changed and the, the more quality materials that we've had over the years, the strengths have been increased and you don't have to have that herringbone. That herringbone gear is a very strong gear and it doesn't have a thrust load because it's got a right hand and left hand, so your thrust problems disappear with the herringbone gear. And I, I'm sorry I don't have a sample, but I, I don't make them. Um, sprockets, everybody knows what a sprocket is if you've got a bicycle since you were a little kid or some of the $7,000 bicycles that they built out of Kevlar and crazy stuff now. But uh, this is a sprocket, obviously much bigger. This one is a double sprocket for a double chain. But this is probably a number 60 chain, much coarser than your, than your bicycle chain. But sprockets are good for transmission where you got a long space. And you don't, have, you don't want to make a huge gear to chase the space. You can do it with a sprocket. I think um, some of your, your hot rod cars that you race and the cars are driven with sprockets. And if you look at some of the old early cars, they were driven with sprockets in the back. They have a, shaft come back and then put a pair of sprockets on it. Um, probably bicycles the most common one. I don't make anything for bicycles. But anyway, that's a, that's a sprocket. Okay. Silent chain sprockets. There's another kind of chain, and, and I'm sorry, I don't have a sample of that either. Um, I thought I had one, but I couldn't find it. It looks similar to a spur gear, but a silent chain sprocket is a series of little plates put together. And if you're designing a very heavy drive, an industrial drive, and you've got a big motor, and you need to drive, I'll tell you where they use these. They use them in steel mills. They use them in uh, paper mills where they have a real drive. And they come four or five inches wide, and they have little plates on the side that keep it from moving off. And it's a series of steel plates that the chain is. It's very, very strong. It's not a roller chain. There's no rollers in it. It's strictly little plates. And the gears are always hard. They almost look like a spur gear. Um, it's rare. I don't see it much anymore. I used to see it more, but I, I don't see the, the, but if you hear a silent chain, and that's exactly what it is. It's very quiet. It doesn't make any noise. And it's very strong. So it's a, it's a good drive system if you were going to use versus a, a roller type chain, like a bicycle chain. Um, racks. Um, Racks are linear motion, so that we. This is a fuel control system, and if you're, if anybody has diesel engines, the older diesel engines, they used to say, the uh, rack opened and closed the uh, the injector on a diesel engine. They used to say, oh, it went to rack, and it's because it, it fully accelerated. I think that's with some of these new diesel engines that's disappearing, but the older ones. Uh, this was a fuel control system, and you can see the teeth are like this, and the little gear rolls like this and this moves back and forth and so the I think this actually is a piston that drives the gear back and forth so that's it works in the opposite for most of them but you get these in big long 8 foot 10 foot 12 foot sections you can roll things back and forth on them um, old one I saw a huge one uh, we were in, we were in Colorado and we went to an old <coughs> marble mine and on top of that they had a huge cutting disc and they had to roll it back and forth across some I-beams, and they drove it back and forth with a rack. When they cut the marble and sliced it up with this huge cutting tool, they used a rack to move the whole system back and forth. So that's, this one's a fancy little one, but they make them big too. I make racks. Um, splines, I love splines because it's a great way to connect it. So, as a matter of fact, a couple of those gears going around have splines. And this actually, this one, this little gear is a spline, or it's not a gear, it's a spline. And instead of having a keyway, just a single tooth, 
if you really want to attach a gear or anything, a pulley, to a shaft, it's a much better way than doing it with a keyway. And it costs about the same. For me to cut a spline, a series of teeth, on a gear cutting machine, it's almost faster than doing it on a mill where you have to put a keyway in. And now you've got six, seven, eight, 12 teeth, whatever's in the spline, in the, in, in the, um, in the inside and outside, and you've got that driver that's a much, much better driver. So I love splines. It's easy to put the inside, we pull a brooch through it, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute when we get to the tools. So that's a spline. If you're gonna put the two things together, it, it's a great way to do it. So that's a spline, okay? Now we have types of cutters. And these are where you need to just be a little bit careful because the edges are sharp. And as we go through them, I'll pass them around so you can really feel how they weigh and what they look like and get a, get a sense of what they are. In the old days, gears have been around for a long, long time. My dad started with Fellows Gear Shaper in Vermont in 1928 uh, as a tool and cutter design engineer. And the Fellows machines, the gear shapers, were initially developed in the late 1800s. So they've been around a long time in the, in the mechanism for cutting gears. But one of the ways, and still used, but one of the ways that they're cut is with a single tooth rotary cutter. And those were some of the first types of machines. You put this on a milling machine with an indexing head. Has everybody gone and taken a machine shop course or been in the machine shop over here? So you understand what a dividing head is and you divide, you rotate this through, cut one tooth, index it, cut another tooth, index it, cut another tooth. So it's a very slow way of doing it. Um, but this was probably the original way of doing it, uh, and it's still used. I've got some really big cutters that are much bigger than the hobs and the other tools that I have. And once in a great, great while, we'll cut a single tooth cutter. We do it on a gear cutting machine where the indexer is automatic, but it's still one tooth at a time, index one tooth at a time. And that's what this is. This is a rotary type cutter, okay? Edges are sharp. Okay. Hobs. This is a, I've actually got two different kinds of hobs, but this is the general hob right here. Now, this is not gold, although it looks really pretty and nice. It's actually a coating on the steel steel cutter. Like that's that would be the original color, and then we have these titanium nitride, and this goes into a furnace, and they put this coating on, and it makes the hob last a lot longer. We don't have to sharpen it. That's awesome. So what this does is, and I'd, someday it would be nice to bring the machine, but if you're really curious and would like to see how we do this, you're welcome to come to the company. We can show you how we do this. But this cutter rotates, okay? And the part that we're cutting rotates like this. And they rotate in time. The machine is timed. The new machines are done with CNC controls. Our older machines were done with gearing. And we still have some of both. Um, almost all our machines are going towards CNC controls. And what this does is this feeds across the tooth form. It's rotating while it does it. It's actually a thread. If you look at it, it'll, you'll see when you get it in your hand that it's actually a thread. It's not just a series of grooves in the cutter. And that's how it works. And it will cut them. Now, we, we, this, this cutter would probably, in say a 4140 alloy, would probably cut 2,000 gears, maybe a little more. And what we do is it gets dull, we sharpen it right here. You can, we have a grinder that comes down and sharpens the face of these teeth. And it, so it, what happens is this is a fairly, this might even be, this is a brand new one. This has never been sharpened. But eventually this tooth will, will get all the way back down here. It'll, all of this will be ground away. And when it's finally worn out, it, you lose the tooth form. It will no longer give you the tooth form and then it's into the junkyard with the, with the hob. That's, that's how you get life out of the hob. It's a great way. It's one of the most common ways of cutting. Uh, most of your high speed cutting for automotive gears and that kind of thing are done with a hob. They're much quicker. They're very fast doing that. And then we have shaping cutters. So in this particular instance, we have a cutter, a part that goes around, and we have the shaper cutter and it shapes like this, and at the same time it turns. And the cutter, the piece you're cutting, also rotates in time. 
The newer machines, again, do be done by CNC. The older machines are done by gearing. And the same thing here, this is titanium nitride. And at this, we grind this surface here. And eventually, this cutter will come down and down until there's almost nothing left of it. And so we get a lot of light. Again, this would cut several thousand gears in, uh, in an alloy steel before it was worn out and gone. I don't make any of these tools. These tools are made by people that do nothing but make the tools. Again, be careful, this is sharp. Um, but it is fun to watch it. It'll, it, it will really cut, we cut these very, very quickly in some cases, so. This is the gear shaper, okay? And I have another one, that's for external gears. And then we also cut internal gears, or sometimes we cut internal splines. The black gear, the big one that I had there in the beginning there, um, has, has an internal spline that's blind. And the only way you can cut that is to cut it with one of these. And this is an internal shaper cutter. And that sits again in the machine, and it has stroke lengths by, we have several, some of them are real long, some of them are shorter. That determines how long we can stroke an internal spline. And this is an internal spline cutter. Um, with a, It fits into a tapered holder in the spindle of the machine, and it shapes like this, the same way as the other one. It rotates as well, so the you get even wear all the way around the tooth. And when you're done, you've got an internal spline or an internal gear. This one happens to be a spline. Okay. Okay, any questions so far? You know, it might be that good already. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the large helical gear going around when you first passed out, I noticed uh, some poles drilled in, some tiny holes. Uh huh. Uh, what's the reason you behind that? What's your jing? It's, it's oil. It's, oh. it's oil lubrication, so the oil will go through it. That's, that's what that one's for. Now, the little bevel gear that's going around with all the little holes around it, that's just lightning holes. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, like in the... In, right, in between the teeth. Yeah. yeah, that's for oil to splash in between the teeth. The trick is to keep the oil on the tooth surface. And if they're running too fast, two things happen. One is if it's going too fast, it spins all the oil off it. Um, in some cases, we put a phosphate coating with a dry film lube on there to keep the lubrication on the surface of the, of the tooth because it goes so fast it'll spin it off. Or if there's too much pressure, it'll squeeze the oil out too. So but that, that's what that's for. Okay. okay. Um, we have worm hobs. That gear that you, the, the worm and worm gear you saw going around, this isn't the one that cut that one, but this is what they look like. You know what, I'm going to pass it around just like this. This one is a multi-start. Yeah, it's better you hold it in your hand. More fun. <laughs> that's a worm hob. It sits in a machine like this. It's got a spindle. This is a multi-start. If you look at it, you can see it's got a lot of starts to it. And this cuts the worm. In the worm gear case, we have the worm gear up here. And we actually drop the worm gear right into the center of this. So this cuts. <coughs> It's cutting and the headstock of the machine is driving it down into it until it's reached its spot that it's done. And then it retracts and we can put another gear in. But this is cut, this doesn't move. All the other cutters we have rotate, move back and forth. These are fixed. The gear comes down into the cutter. Of course it's rotating when that happens. If it's not rotating, we break the cutter. So the trick is to do that correctly. And it's done under oil. We, we use oil while we're cutting that. So this is a worm hob. That's what we cut that worm gear with. Okay. Okay. Bevel cutters. We have two different kinds of bevel cutters. Uh, we have both of them have a coniflex system. If you look at a bevel, the tooth is actually curved. You can't see it, it doesn't look that way, but it's actually got a curve to the tooth and it makes it work very, very well. The old fashioned ones before that were straight and there was no curve to them and they wore out more quickly. So we have two different versions. One is, the first one we have is a two-tool generator. These look like two razor blades. And they sit in the machine with these two teeth that sit like this. I'll, you can see them. And, th and these two blades move back and forth like this and actually cut a tooth. Uh, what we can do with that is if we have a hub that sticks out or the tooth is blind, we can cut it with it, with it in its blind condition. So. This is what they call a two-tool generator. Again, all these tools can be sharpened, and these do the same thing. You can see they've been sharpened and they've been cut 
here and here. This one's been sharpened. But these go into the machines and they're Gleason machines. Um, the European version is a, called a Klingenberg, but the Gleason machine is what we use. We don't use the European system, we use the Gleason system. So this is the two-tool generator. And then we also have a rot rotary cutter set that is, and I'm going to pass around the box because these are really sharp. And these two tools engage um, with, a, with a cutter system. I'm not sure I can hold these right. But you can see these are very, very, these, these little teeth are very sharp. And as these rotate, they cut through the tooth. And you do it in the, in the Gleason system or in the double generation. We do them one tooth at a time. I look at the machine and I can't quite figure out how it works. It's the most complex of all the gear cutting machines to set up and the most complex to run. And there's a series of angles on the bevel gear and um, they're much more difficult to run. We have a whole series of inspection devices where we make, we try to always get the pair of gears so we can make the two together and that's really what we try to do. So I'm going to pass these around. Be careful, they are, this one is sharp as well. Okay. Okay. Then we have, to put the internal spline in, as I talked about before, we use a brooch. This is a brooch, and this obviously is a relatively small spline. We have some brooches that are like this big around and this tall, but they look just like this one. Just, uh, I can put this in the suitcase. The other ones don't fit. So this one, you put the, the, the part, if I wanted to put the spline and say this, I would have a hole and match this, and this, this is the pilot right here, and that would go through here like that, fit into the pilot, then we have a hydraulic machine that pulls it through the part. So this goes like that, and when it's done, the last four or five teeth are all the same size, and they're called sizing teeth, and they give us a spline in, you know, a, a minute or so, and so it's a very, very accurate way of doing that. And we can sharpen this as well. This can be sharpened several times before it's worn out, and these tools are and this is a brooch, this is a spline brooch rather than a keyway brooch or some other type of sliding brooch. But that's a spline brooch. Um, then we have shaving, which is taking a good gear and we roll this cutter against it. And it's kind of cool if you look at it, you'll see it's got slots on the side. And uh, I have no idea how they do this. Um, they do it with, now they do it with EDM, but these have been around since the 30s and 40s, long before EDM was ever around. And I'm assuming they had some kind of fancy machine that did this slotting in this, in this part. And what this does is it rolls against the gear and it shaves just a little bit of material off the tooth form. It takes a gear that's good and makes it a really good gear. The sides of the teeth get correct. Uh, we take run out out of it. Every gear is an egg. And our whole trick when we're making gears is to make it as small an egg as we possibly can. And this helps remove the egg um, in it. And this is a, called a shaving cutter. Okay. Okay. And then we have grinding. We, and grinding is taking a hardened gear that's still a good gear, but it's gone through a hardening process. It'll be rock hard. And we have a grinding wheel. Our grinding wheels for the gear grinder are about this big. And they grind the tooth much like the shaver does. But it's a much more expensive process if you're designing it. You really don't want to get a gear unless you're going to run it very fast. And it needs to be very, very accurate at the speeds it's going to run. We make transmission gears for um, and what looks like an airplane engine, but it's, it's a tank engine and it's air-cooled. And they have some very high speeds in that, and they want them the, the gear to be uh, the gear to be ground. So I, I'm sorry I can't bring one of those in. I'd have to bring another suitcase just to bring my grinding wheel in. Okay. Okay. Measurement and quality. This is an area as engineers, you have to think about being cost effective. And that, that's probably true in almost any engineering discipline that you do or anything that you design, not just gears, but one of the things if you highly tolerant something, 
Um, in fact, you can create a monster by, in terms of cost, by upping it way, way, way beyond what you need. I see a lot of it. I see somebody that says, well, the bearing book says to put a five-tenths tolerance on it. I'll make it better. I'll make it three-tenths. You really didn't make it any better at all. You just made it more expensive. That's all. So when you're designing something, think about tolerances that are uh, economical to build. One of the ways that we check gears, we have master gears. This is a master gear. Uh, this has a very, very, very slight egg shape to it. We don't make these. These are made, this little gear that I'm holding right here as a master gear is probably worth $2,500 just for one gear. So it gives you an idea how expensive and how tight the tolerances are on these, these master gears. And we roll our gears that we're making against this. And the, the area where the gear that we're rolling is on a table that moves in and out. And so as it rotates around, we have a dial indicator. Everybody know what a dial indicator is? And as it moves in and out, the dial indicator tells you first how much run out you have from one tooth to the other tooth, and it also tells you the total composite error, the error all the way around it, how big an egg your gear really is. We also can attach what is electrocardiogram, basically, and it'll make a chart, just like when you go to the doctor and have an electrocardiogram, we can make one of those of the gear and it'll show the run out, and it'll show tooth to tooth like this, and then it'll show run out that shows as it goes around like this. And we have customers that demand that we put those, um, those, those types of charts with every part. We made um, 26,000, which is very unusual for us, uh, fin controls for the Patriot missile. And if you don't know about the Patriot, the Patriot is an uh, anti-missile missile, and it's uh, very effective to protect everybody, actually. And there are four on every one of them. And, the, uh, and we, we had to send the chart with a little gear on the, on the fin control with every one of them. So I got to go to Lockheed Martin who was building it, and the guy got to talk to the guy that was actually using it. And we changed the way we packaged them because they were driving him crazy. He had to do all this unpacking. So anyway, I was talking with him, and I said, so what do you do with those little charts? And I said, I don't even know what those are. I throw them away. So they were paying us $2 a piece and they threw them all away. It was, was crazy. It was one of the print requirements, but the guy using them, he, he didn't care. As long as the thing went in at work, he was good for that. So that's a master gear. Um, we also have a gear system that's now a probe. It's got a little tiny ruby on the end of the probe, and it's computerized, and it will go up and down the tooth all the way around, and it will give us a readout and a chart. Um, it's more expensive than it's it's not something that's real handy out on the floor of the shop. This is real handy. You can put it on there and just roll it here and you know right away that it's got good run out or bad run out. But if we want it when we're grinding, if we want to know what profile is, we want to know all the different forms of the gear, it'll actually give us like six pages of documentation of what the gear is. And so it's, it's pretty slick, but it's, it's a machine that's uh, I couldn't believe they get $300,000 for this little machine. It's about the size of this table. I told that to my wife, and she was like, what? what? We, could, we could have a bigger house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. And uh, another way of checking gears is to do what you'll see sometimes pin size or wire size on a blueprint. And this is what these are. These are wires. And uh, we have little tiny ones for little tiny gears, every pitch has a size that it's supposed to use. And these are the these are the pins. And I brought you just a set of the pins. And what you do here is you put that into the tooth of the gear on either side, and then you measure across a micrometer. And these run on the pitch diameter when it's in the correct size. So it's a very quick way of determining when you've cut the gear properly into the right depth. But you'll see on a, on a blueprint, we'll see a pin requirement or a wire size requirement. They're, they're the same, one and the same, but I bring in these little pins. You know, a set of these, this is probably a $250 set of pins here. So the, they're very, very accurate. They were like in 50 millions. We can't even measure them. We have to send them back to have them calibrated because they're such, such fine tolerances on it. That's why they're so expensive. So if you see that, that's that. Quality levels of gears are designated as tooth-to-tooth. -to -tooth. That's the error from one tooth to the other and run out. 
total composite error, TIR, uh, those, are, those are things. Total composite error, um, total indicator error. Um, and then we also have involute error, which is the curve of the tooth. Every gear has tooth curve, and we can actually measure that curve. And that's called the involute error. And we have a lot of gears. Sometimes we cut them because we drive them from one side. We'll get the involute on one side to be good, and the other side won't be good. But it's generally driven by the cutters that you've been passed around there. Two spacing error, that's the spacing error from one tooth to the next tooth. Our probe type machine to check that. And then every gear, we want them to be straight across this way, and that's lead error. So the trick is to get that lead as straight as you can, but we can actually measure that gear in tenths, ten thousandths of an inch, what the, what the lead error is. Um, blank quality. When we start a gear like this, or we start a gear like this, we start the blank, if, no matter how good my gear cutting equipment is, if I got a piece of junk as a machine blank, I'm going to have a junk gear. So the trick is, and one of the problems we have is machine shops will send us stuff to cut, and they're not as accurate in their run out and face squareness and all kinds of stuff. We have a heck of a time cutting it. We, we put all kinds of tolerances on a gear blank that are not on the print, because if we don't tolerance it, we can't cut the gear correctly. So this is the why the blanks have to be so accurate. I'll pass these around too. This is this one goes into a some kind of control and this is actually goes into a Pratt wind Pratt engine, but it's made by General Electric. I don't know why that is, but it's a general electric part, but we make it for Pratt and Whitney engine. Anyway, maybe they stole it. I don't know. All I know is we make it and this this little gear is um, like a custom 455 stainless. And this little gear is probably 800 bucks for this in quantities of 50 or 60. So there, it's, a, it's a lot of work and it ends up, if, as you'll see it, it's, it's everything's located. All these little flaps on the side, the drill holes, everything's located. So that's, that's where that goes. Um, we're gonna get types of machines, but let me pass these other two gears out. If you look at this one, this is a non-circular gear. It's a triangle. And it runs with another one that looks just like it, actually. And we, uh, we cut those, and, uh, and some of them we wire EDM, but they're, that, that's a non-circular gear. Actually, what it does, I really don't know, because it seems to me you could do it with two round gears, but for some reason they've got the, the non-circular gears. And this gear is a pretty complex gear because everything's lined up. The two gear, these two gears are lined up with a non-circular gear. And so this ends up being a, a very expensive little gear when it's done. So, thank you. And this one, how many people have uh, flown in an airplane now that you can use your Wi-Fi? You, know, you can do your computer on, you can go online. Not all the airplanes have them yet because they're, they're still <coughs> retrofitting the old planes and stuff. And this actually is going to, goes into a system where you can use your cell phone so if you're sitting in the middle seat, and you're tell, you're gonna be, you might get stuck between two people talking on their cell phones on a four-hour flight. Might might not be the happiest thing that you ever want to do. But this is this goes into this drives the antenna system for one of the devices that is allowing you to have Wi-Fi, and it sits up on top of the plane. If you look at it, it's got a little dome or a bump. I know on the Jet Blue planes, it has a, a pretty good size dump, bump up there, and that's that sits up in there. This is. 7075 aluminum, and it's nickel plated. And so it really is a slick looking. It doesn't look anything like this when we get through machining it because it's just everyday old aluminum. And then they send it out to nickel plate, and you don't have to polish it or anything. That's the way it comes back. Do you guys handle a lot of your plating your components? No, no, I, I send plating out and I send heat treat out and non destructive testing. Those are the three things that I don't do. I do have an MPI and a nitile edge system, but it's just for our own use. If we get some steel in, we suspect might be bad. We want a mag particle it so we can find cracks. And in grinding, we have to nitile etch. Nitile etch is you, um, you dip something in a very small concentration of nitric acid, and if it's been burned by a grinding wheel, and you can burn it with a grinding wheel, it'll show up black spots on the part. And we just do it for our own internal use. But this is, this is a, 
you know, we, we've done probably five or six hundred of these gears. So they're in a lot of airplanes out yeah. there. They're continuing to do it. But I love the, it's, a, it's just a beautiful looking gear. It's really a work of art. It, it gets that way when that nickel plating, so. It's not very heavy. It's a, it doesn't, okay. Okay. Types of machines. We have a lot, we have, like I said, we have 140 machines of which probably 35 or 40 are strictly gear cutting machines. We have gear hobbers, machines that use the rotating cutter that you saw before, the gold plated one. Um, we use the gear shapers, and I've listed some names in here. The gear generators, there's really two basic systems, there's Gleason and there's a Klingberg they use in Europe. Um, gear shavers, gear grinders, our brooch is horizontal and we have a vertical brooch. Our big brooches that are like this big around, we broach vertically with a huge hydraulic ram. Um, and then the rotary cut, the rotary, rotary ones machines, I've actually got pictures of where my dad started um, in something after 1928 and they were driven by a single electric motor with belt driven and all the belts came down to the machines. You've seen them, it's like these almost look like a sepia. They're brown, they're so old. But here's all these guys with coveralls on, and they've got the machine. They look like they're right out of the 1920s in the, in the way the machines look. It's, it's kind of fun. And they had brown and sharp, and they had Gleason machines that were rotary machines, strictly from the ceiling. So that was cool. Then we use coolants. Uh, one of the things, if you walk into my shop, you'll get a the smell of an oil, as you would in any machine shop. And the smell, we use two different kinds of basic coolants. In all our gear cutting machines, we use oil. A lot of it is the mobile oil, synthetic oils. Uh, they seem to work the best, but in real heavy <coughs> cutting, we use a highly sulfurized oil. It smells awful, and it's just as, it's as black as this is, and it's just really, really thick, but it really works well between with heavy cutting, the, uh, the, the oils work really well. Um, we use water soluble in most of our CNC turning, CNC milling, CNC grinding. We use the soluble, and sol soluble oils, and that's where we put a gallon in, and then we put 10 gallons of water in. But it's actually a soluble oil. And if, when you pick it up in your hands, it feels oily, but it's mostly water, and we can thin it Grinders use much thinner oil than the other ones. We recycle our oil, we take our chips and we spin them, and then we run a, the oil through a centrifuge that takes all the little tiny fines out, and we salvage all that oil. So the only oil that we use up and throw away is what gets splashed on the floor. Everything else gets recycled again and again and again. The water-soluble oil, we have a constant filter system that takes the tramp oils, because in a machine, you get drippings from hydraulics and uh, lubrication on the spindles, drips in it, and it makes this gooey brown stuff. And we have to get that out of the water soluble oils. We do that. And we use some chemical coolants that are just straight chemicals. We have some, you have to put ionized water in it. Um, we've kind of gone away from that. The first one we really tried took all the paint off the machine. So we weren't happy. You got this brand new machine, all of a sudden there's no paint on it. Just peeled it right off like a. Okay, um, well, if you're designing it, I gave you some tables here, and these are really good tables. They tell us everything that we need to know to make a gear, or any gear manufacturer does. So stick this in your notebook, who knows, maybe 10 years from now you might have to design a gear, and if you go into some of the tables, there's 50 things on there. This is, this is actually more than we actually need. But this is a really good format for filling in the gears. The bottom one is a spline, um, and, it, and it does the same thing. If you look at this, the tooth form and where it comes from, if you, get, if you fill in the blanks on those, that's all I need to do to, to make the gear to the quality that you want. Just remember, in a gear quality, the, as the number goes up, it becomes more expensive. That master gear is a quality 15. That's why it's 2500 bucks for that thing. If you go down to a quality eight to nine, which is probably the kind of gears you'd find in your car, you can see it's a much lower number. A three or four is the kind of thing that you find in steel mills and 
uh, mines where there's a lot of space between the teeth and run out really isn't a big criteria. Um, so those are, those are the things that you want to think about when you, when you do that. Um, again, I, I talked about drafting overkill or tolerance overkill, just be careful of that. There's some really great resources. They're all online now. They used to be, I used to bring the books with me, but that was another 30 pounds of books. Uh, but the AGMA, you can go online and you can see all the characteristics that they require on the gears. Uh, machinery's handbook. Does everybody in here have a machinery's handbook? Does anybody know what it is? <laughs> machinery's handbook, I should have, I'm sorry I didn't bring one. It's about this thick, it's, gr it's this big and it's green. And it's been around 180 years probably, 150 years. And inside it's everything that you need to know from a mechanical engineering and they keep adding to it and adding to it. And I know it's online now too, but the book is a great reference for all different kinds of things. Everything from the size of I-beams and what strength it takes to hold up a building with it, to gear data, to gear numbers. So it's just a great reference book. Van Curen has a book of wires that tells us all about how to use the wires and it's a very, very interesting book on, on how that works. And Gleason, as you saw the bevel gears, you actually have three angles on a bevel gear that we have to know. One is the face angle, that's the most obvious one, but then we have the pitch diameter, the pitch angle, and then we have the root angle. And those three angles we set on the Gleason machine. And we have tables that tell you, if you've got 41 teeth and 30 teeth in the set of gears, it'll tell you exactly what all those angles are supposed to be. And I think Gleason tables, I think, are also online too. Some of them, they're gonna charge you to, to use them, but pretty much all that stuff is online. Okay, okay. So that's that's my little gear lecture. Um, and my company is it's. Uh, well, let me just tell you a little bit more about the company because it, we kind of cut that off. Uh, my dad started it in 1957, so we've been around for 50 plus years, 57 years this year. I came there in 1968 when I got out of the Navy, so I've been doing this since 1968. I started as a kid when I didn't have anything to do on a Saturday. My father would make me go clean machines and clean fans. We, this was in New England. There was no air conditioning. Today, I'd throw a fan away before I would ever clean a fan. <laughs> but I learned how to run all those machines and just grew up in the business, so I've been around it basically almost all my life. We have a lot of great employees. We have some legacies. Uh, we have three people that work for us that their parents work for us. We have, uh, we're an ESOP, which is an employee stock ownership program. In my mid 40s, which was, seems like it was a long time ago, it was a long time ago, um, I decided that a lot of companies, when they, when they get to be my age now, they want to sell their business and then they go trying to go into the marketplace and they can't find a buyer. And the buyer that's coming in wants to destroy the company or sell it down or move it somewhere else. Um, in my case, I didn't want that to happen. So over the years, I've sold my company to the employees so they own a portion of it. They don't own it all yet, but they own a good portion of the company. And it's a great program. It's kind of like a profit sharing plan. Uh, they don't have to pay into it. They just get it by time frame and how much they make and, and, it's, uh, and we have an administrator that does that. We, um, we sell about $12 million worth of product a year, all made right here in Miami, all made by uh, good employees and that have been with us a long time. I have a, my guy that does the broaching that pulls that long thing, he's 77 years old and he's, um, he's Polish and his son is flying C-130s and he's very proud of that. And as he should be. And he was in the Polish Navy, and I was in the Navy, so we have a lot in common. We talk about all kinds of crazy stuff with the Navy. But I actually have three Polish people. The guy that runs my, my uh, floor is Vietnamese. I have several African Americans. I have, um, I have a plethora of Hispanics everywhere from Brazil to uh, Colombia to the islands to Central and South America. Um, we are a microcosm of what the United States is. It's so many people from so many places that have come here in many, many ways. Um, my, my 
grandfather came here from Norway, so I'm half Norwegian. He couldn't speak Norwegian when he got here. I mean, he couldn't speak English when he got here. He spoke great Norwegian. Uh, and they, at that time, when you came to New York at the turn of the century, they said, okay, if you want a farm, we'll give you 40 acres in Minnesota. And so my grandfather said, I hated being a farmer. That's what I was in Norway. And he invented a machine that, if you look at hydraulic hose, it's wrapped. My grandfather's machine still runs. My cousin moved it to Akron, Ohio. Uh, and they, that's how hydraulic, it's made on the Turkelson machine, my grandfather's machine. He was the epitome of the American dream. He came here with nothing, and built a company. He invented a machine that inserted bristles into the, the top of a cap that paints your fingernails, or any little bottle that you need to paint. And it, so he built the injection molding machine and he figured out how to inject the bristles into the thing. And his biggest customer was um, Revlon. And they made millions of those things. Um, he made a machine that wrapped tires. This is probably nobody here ever remembers tires that were wrapped in paper, but back in the 40s and 50s, so the vulcanizing wasn't very good. And if you stacked a bunch of tires together, they stuck together. So they wrapped them in paper so they wouldn't stick together. So when you went to the tire store, all the tires were wrapped in paper. My, my grandfather did that. So um, I never met him. He was dead before I was born. But he, I loved going in his basement because he had all these neat tools and stuff like that. So um, I, I just tell that side story because it is, it, it, this is such a, in my perception, is such a great company, country, for being able to do this. You can start on your own. I hope you'll think about being entrepreneurial and going out and starting your own company and working in your own company. And uh, it, it's it's great fun. It's sometimes terrorizing. Um, over the years, have it all kinds. I'm in another few years. I'm going to write a book of all the experiences that I've had uh, over the years, with mostly with people things that happen. But it's been a great great time and. Uh, I have great engineers that work for me. Some of them are classically trained. Some of them are people that have just learned the business and come up through it. Uh, like I say, I've got machinists out there that is probably as good an engineer as you'd ever want to get to the specific area that they work in. And we build artistic stuff. You've seen some of the things that we pass around. So it's great fun. If you're ever in the neighborhood and want to stop by, we'll be glad to give you a tour. Are we on time today? We are okay. Good. Okay, good. <laughs> well, we wish. And I, I left some business cards up here. If you want to grab a card, I left some cards up here. And if you would, don't steal my gears, please, because I need them back. <laughs> Thank you so much. Cool.